Please give your attention to the reading of God's word. 1 Corinthians 12, 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one is speaking in the spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord, except the Holy Spirit. This is the holy, inerrant word of the Lord. Today we have a special guest speaker, Roland Lee. Um, he is our potential youth candidate for, or youth pastor candidate. Uh, there is a question and answer session at 1245 today, so please stick around for that. He is joined today by his wife, Joyce, and please give him a warm welcome. And, and so we should have probably come in just really early and I could have had this set up. And, oh. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, very blessed to be able to come here and worship with you guys to um, share the message of grace and the word of God. And it is a blessing and it is a great privilege. And I, I thank you for that. And I thank the pastors and the elders for inviting me to... Um, come and share the message of what it means to be spiritual. Now, before I get into this message, <clears throat> one thing I need to kind of give a little bit of background context is that uh, 1 Corinthians was written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth, of course. Um, however, uh, the church in Corinth, they had a lot of issues. They had a lot of problems. I mean, uh, people were getting drunk at their gatherings. People were fighting, people were suing each other. There's talk about this one guy that was dating his dad's wife, which I'm thinking is a stepmom and not his actual mom. Not that that's any better, of course, okay? But, I mean, they had issues. There were fighting, jealousy, bitterness, divisions, all kinds of problems in that church. And, and so the First Corinthians church was essentially the black sheep of the first century. It was known as a black sheep church. And so for the first 11 chapters of 1 Corinthians, Apostle Paul is guiding them, correcting them, teaching them, and leading them through all the different issues and navigating all the problems that they're going through. However, when we get to chapter 12 and moving forward from that, he does something different. Starting from chapter 12, for the next three chapters, almost 20% of the book, he focuses on one issue and one topic in particular, and that's spirituality. He focuses 20% of the book on the topic of spirituality because that right there was the foundational issues from which all the problems arose. Yes, they had many different problems in the church, however, the foundational root from which it all sprang up was a misunderstanding of what spirituality was. Their misunderstanding of spirituality was essentially like a, a blister on the bottom of your foot. You ever try to walk around with a blister on your foot? <laughs> you're, you're like, ah, you, you kind of walk and you stumble and you tumble. That's why. That's why the church in Corinth was in such chaos and, and, and disorder because of their misunderstanding of what it meant to be spiritual. And so with that in mind, I'm going to be reading our passage one more time again. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, one through three. It reads this, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Amen. So what does it mean to be spiritual? You know, when I hear that word, I think of someone like Benny Hinn. 
He's this very famous TV evangelist who had a healing ministry. If you Google him, you'll see images of him walking around in like a $10,000 suit and, and waving his hand around and people would ah, fall back and they'll start twitching. He, he's shown, you know, waving his coat around and as he does that, people fall over and they start seizing. Not that I believe what he does is actually a work of the Spirit, okay? Don't get me wrong here, okay? I don't believe anything that he does is a work of the, I don't believe that's a work of the Spirit. However, as Christians, we have this perception that spirituality has to do with the miraculous. We often associate and think that spirituality has to do with this mystical, magical stuff. In the ninth century BC, there was this famous general named Naaman. He was a king of the Syrian army. Wonderful, maybe not wonderful warrior, but he was a, he was a very um, well accomplished warrior. He led the armies against Israel and even had victory. However, he had leprosy. That was his one flaw, he had leprosy. And one day he hears that, hey, there's a man of God in Israel. There is a, a person of God, a spiritual person in Israel that can heal him of his leprosy. So he goes to Elijah's house and he knocks on his door. Elijah opens up and he's all like, ah, okay, you got leprosy. You know, I'm paraphrasing here, of course. You have leprosy. Go and wash yourself in the Jordan River seven times and your skin's going to be baby smooth. Naaman turns around and he's mad. I thought that he would have come out, waved his hands around, and called on the name of God and healed him right there. He had this perception, this understanding that spirituality meant mysticism. It meant magical works and powers. So oftentimes, we understand and we connect spirituality with works of power or mysticism or supernatural things. Now, the spiritual person has the Spirit of God indwelling in them, yes. But the way in which the Holy Spirit manifests and makes himself known is in very natural ways. For example, if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, it reads this. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things of God freely given us by God that we may impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. So someone who is spiritual is someone who has received the Holy Spirit. But the display of spirituality is that they understand spiritual truths. In other words, they understand the truth of God. It's not some magical ability or some secret talent that they perform and possess but it's that they understand the word of God. It's incredible. The Holy Spirit, who is God, who dwells in the hearts and lives of his people, makes his spiritual presence known in the very natural way of understanding the word of God. It's the same idea when Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they know me. The spiritual person is spiritual because they hear and know the Lord. If you look at another verse, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, it reads this, But I, brothers, cannot address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, you are not of the flesh. Are you not of the flesh and behaving only in human ways? Paul calls them brothers, and brothers they were, in the fullest sense. There are people who believed in Christ, people who were saved by Christ, people who trusted in God, people who put their lives in God. They are full of the, the Spirit was indwelling them, yes. Yet he could call, not call them spiritual. Incredible that you could be a Christian and not be spiritual. That you could be born again, trusting in God, have your life in God, but not be spiritual. And the display of spirituality, the reason why he did not call them spiritual 
It wasn't because they didn't have a work of power or some magical ability, but for the simple fact that there was jealousy and strife among them. In other words, the only reason that we get in that passage of why Paul does not call them spiritual is because of the way they were treating each other. It had nothing to do with works of power, had nothing to do with mysticism, but simply he says, you're not spiritual, and I can see that because of the way you're treating each other. Too often we think spirituality has to do with supernatural works of power. But in reality, spirituality has much to do with very natural things, like understanding the word of God and how we treat people. You know, Paul writes in verse 1 that he does not want them to be uninformed because ignorance in this spiritual understanding is not bliss. And he brings up their former way of life in verse 2 as an example of how ignorance in spirituality led people astray to mute idols. You know, I remember years ago, years ago, I met this person. Um, he was a fanatic, Christian, but uh, I, I met him a few years ago and he was telling me this story about how he was in the Midwest at, at this huge tent revival. I guess they have revivals in big tents over there in the Midwest somewhere. And he said it was in the middle of summer time. It was hot, he was sweaty. You know, it went on for three, four, five, six days and he was just there praising God day and night, day and night. And he said, during a certain point in time, his eyes started to not become as clear. He started to get a little fuzzy. And as the revival went on, it, it became more fuzzy and more fuzzy, so he couldn't see clearly. And then his friend, moved by the Spirit of God, raised his hands, started speaking in tongues, spit on his hands, and put them on his eyes. And then he looks at me, and he's like, you know what happened next? I know what happens next. He's still wearing glasses. Man, you don't need to tell me what happens next. He, is this, is this the work of the Spirit, or is this just foolishness being led to mute idols that have no power to heal? You know, I have a friend of mine on Facebook. She posts things about going to these spiritual revivals, spiritual conferences, gatherings. She posts videos of people being moved by the Spirit of God, and they're speaking in tongues, but they're... Sounds like people are, like, crying and screaming and barking. Is that the Spirit of God? She posts pictures of this thing, you know, like, um, ah, what do you say? It's like the, the, the gold dust stuff where, where she's praying and like on her hands there's this gold dust and it's like it's the work of God. And I'm, I'm like, sister, that's, that's glitter. <laughs> she posts this picture of at this one gathering where there's a cloud forming in the side of the sanctuary and people are running over stepping on people to be under the cloud and I'm like there's probably a fog machine up there or something I, I don't know you know my father God, God bless him you know he was converted late in life by the grace of God and, and God changed him and saved him and turned him around and he had a hunger to know God and to grow in God and to know the word of God and so he signed up for this Bible class and he's like, hey, my very, very handsome, good-looking son. Back then I was, not now. But he said, you know, will you go with me? I'm like, okay, Dad, I'll go with you. You know, let's go read the Bible together and grow together. And he took me to this place. And the guy was speaking in tongues for like the first half hour. I didn't understand anything he was saying. And he started walking around praying for people. And as he prayed, people started shaking and twitching. And, and he came to us. And I'm like, no, you, you know, we're good, man. You don't need to pray for us. I don't know what that is, but I don't want it. I don't, you know. So back to the issue. So back to the issue. What does it mean to be spiritual? If it's not about the miraculous, if it's not about the mystical, if it's not about these works of powers, what is it about? And how can we know that spirituality, what genuine spirituality is? Paul gives us two markers in verse 3. If we look at uh, 1 Corinthians 12.3, it reads this. 
um, just verse 3 reads this. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says that Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. The first sign that a person is spiritual is that they speak the truth about Jesus. No one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. This is one of the most debated Bible verses in 1 Corinthians. You know, some scholars say that when the people gathered and they were praying and they got uh, emphatic and ecstatic, someone just blurted out, Jesus is accursed. Other commentators say that, you know, when, when they gathered to worship, a, a Jewish sect in, in that group said, you know, if you want to join us, you have to say the phrase, Jesus is accursed. Other people say that it's a misunderstanding of what Paul said in the book of Colossians when he said Jesus redeemed us from the curse by becoming a curse for us. You know, so there's much debate about the specific meaning of that passage, but the general meaning is that a spiritual person speaks the truth about the person, nature, and work of Christ. You know, the Jewish people in the Bible said many claims about Jesus, many of them being false. They claimed he was just the son of Joseph. They claimed he was a deceiver. They claimed he was born in Galilee. They claimed that he was a drunkard. They claimed that he was doing miracles by the work of Satan himself. Yet not one of these claims was true. And they proved themselves not to be spiritual. Throughout church history, and even today, there are many false claims made about the nature, work, and person of Christ. Even in the time of Paul. If you look at 2 Timothy 2, 17 and 18, Paul says, among them are Hermaeus and Philetus. I, th I think I have a different translation. Who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. So Paul was writing young Timothy saying that there's these two guys in the church that claim that Jesus had returned, that Jesus had taken his people to be with them and left everybody else. And the result was that they were upsetting the faith of some people. Now this word, upsetting, it's, it's not strong enough. Um, the King James says, overthrow. The NIV says, destroy. In other words, false teachings about the nature, work, and life of Jesus overthrow, destroy the faith of God's people. That misunderstandings about Christ ruin the faith of God's people, causes them to stumble, causes them to be overturned, causes them to be stifled in their growth of Christ. It causes them to become ineffective for the work and the kingdom of God. Just think of the prosperity gospel nowadays. Just come to church, give us some money, and God's going to bless you. Is that all God cares about? Is that all God wants? Is that all God wants us to accomplish in life? Just think about the therapeutic gospel. Ah, oh, it's okay. Jesus paid for your sins. You know, just live however you want. Enjoy. Shouldn't I live differently, Pastor? Shouldn't, shouldn't, I, shouldn't I, I, I respond differently to the life and grace that I have received from Christ? Ah, oh, it's okay, you know. No call for repentance, no call for change, no call for righteousness. What's at stake is our very life of faith itself. And these false statements, they eat away and chew up the faith of God's people, leading them astray keeping them from moving forward and growing in the faith and grace of God. Acts 17 says this, The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they had arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if the things were so. Paul came to the city and shared about the person, nature, and work of Christ. And they eagerly accepted his word. However, they searched the scriptures to make sure what he was saying is true. They searched diligently to see if what this person said matched up with what the word of God said. Because they knew how important it was to accept the truth of Christ. 
few weeks ago. I was, actually this was about a month and a half ago. I was at Baskin Robbins with my wife. And uh, my beautiful wife over there. And I tried strawberry ice cream for the first time in my life. And I'm gonna tell you something. Strawberry ice cream at Baskin Robbins is delicious. I mean, this is amazing. It's good. They got these little strawberry trunks inside it. They, I, I don't know what they put in it, but it's, it's so good. And I was telling my wife how this is the best ice cream ever, how I love it. Not more than her, though, or my kids, but I, I really like it a lot. And she's like, is this the first time you've tried it? I'm like, yes, it is. And she's like, how is that possible? Did you have an allergic reaction? Do you not like it? Did you have some kind of trauma, like a strawberry truck fell on you when you were a little kid or something? What happened? I told her, the reason why I never ate strawberry ice cream growing up as a kid is because it's pink. <laughs> Pink's a girl's color. I grew up in a time and in a place where if you ate something pink, had something pink, wore something pink, you are not a guy. <laughs> now that I'm older, I realize, yes, you know, pink's just a color. It's just a color. It doesn't matter, you know? But I believe this lie about a color that, had, that spoke into about um, masculinity that kept me from enjoying this delicious ice cream. Friends, it's the same thing when it comes to the truth about the work, nature, and life of Jesus Christ. If we accept false statements, whether we know it or not, it will keep us from enjoying and partaking of the beautiful and delicious life, a spiritual life that we have available in Christ. That's how important the truth is about the work and nature of Christ. Secondly, as it says in verse 3, no one can say that Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. The spiritual person is a person who professes that Jesus is Lord. Now, anyone can say Jesus is Lord. Pull up any guy on the street, give him 20 bucks, this is what I want you to read, and they'll read it and say it. Anybody can say the words Jesus is the Lord apart from the Holy Spirit. But nobody can profess that Jesus is Lord with their lives without the Holy Spirit. It's not about a confession with our lips, but a confession with our lives. And apart from the work and the power of the Holy Spirit, it's not made. You know, too often we fail to understand that we're dead to the things of God. When we were born, we were born dead to the things of God, to His love, to His grace, to His nature, to His work, to His calling. However, God, by His Holy Spirit, made us alive to Him. It's called regeneration. It's like having a car with a dead battery. You know, you could turn that key as many times as you want, but that car is not going to start and it's not going to take you where we need to go. But too often, so many Christians today nowadays are trying to get out of the car and they're pushing that car, trying to get to work, trying to do this, trying to do that, trying to be spiritual, trying to do all these things. But there's no power, there's no grace, there's no life because there's no work of the Holy Spirit in them. It is the work of the Holy Spirit in us and through us that makes the confession that Jesus is Lord with our lives. As Romans 8.11 says, If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Amen. Christians are spiritual people. And we are called to be spiritual people. But not all Christians are spiritual. You know, 1 Corinthians 12 is like, you know the little triangle piece on a teeter-totter? Chapters 1 through 11 is a picture of Christians who aren't spiritual. However, the second half is, is kind of like chapters 12 and on, showing a glimpse of what it means to be spiritual in the life that is available to us in Christ. The spiritual person is someone who knows and accepts the truth about Jesus and has been brought to life by the Holy Spirit 
and is enabled to make the confession that Jesus Christ is Lord with their lives. Not that the spiritual person is perfect. Not that the spiritual person doesn't make mistakes and falters and falls. It's just that the spiritual person accepts the word of God and is moved by the Holy Spirit to obey God and to become a living testimony for the glory of God. You know, many years ago, before DNA testing and was around, there was a man in Kingston, New York, who happened to pass away. And he had a nephew living in Europe. And so the, the, the judge of that town sent envoys to, to Europe to go f track down his nephew and let him know that his uncle had passed away and that, you know, you need to come and claim the, the estate. He left behind a huge estate, hundreds of millions of dollars in today's time. The locals officials, you know, they, they went out on that, that mission to find him. But as you can imagine, a lot of people showed up to claim the, the money, right? All these people showed up with pictures, you know, with them and their, their grandma or some actor that they paid. They show up with birth certificates, you know, documents, a photo, a doctored photo, saying this is my uncle. You know, Photoshop back in the days. One by one, the judge said, no, this is false, this is wrong, the, these documents are phony, and he shut them down one by one. And then this one guy shows up. He says, Your Honor, uh, this guy's my uncle. I'm here to um, take over the estate. And the judge looks at him and, you know, okay, this is yours. Uh, go speak to my clerk and he'll have you sign the paperwork. And afterward, the clerk asked him, <laughs> how could you just, Your Honor, uh, this guy shows up with no paperwork, shows up with nothing has no proof, no identification, nothing at all. How could you just sign over hundreds of millions of dollars to this guy? And so the judge told them, you know, his family and my family, we go way back. We know him and they know us. And if one thing we know about his family is that every male born in that family has a crooked nose that bends a certain way. So I knew the moment I saw him that he was the heir. Friends, that's how we know if we are spiritual or not. There's a certain distinction in us and through us that can only be, and co that can only come out of us by the work of the Holy Spirit in us as we obey the word of God. It's a reflection of the life of God, the reflection of his mercy, his grace, his goodness, his kindness, his Holy Spirit at work in us and through us. That's how you know. That's how we know. You want to talk about spiritual maturity? It's not about what we know in one sense, yes, but, but in the other sense, it's just knowing the word of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit leading us to convict us to obey the word of God and doing the word of God in our lives. That's what spirituality is all about. It's not about the mystical. It's not about the magical. It's not about the miraculous. It's simply to know God, to know his word, and to live a life that reflects it. It's my hope and prayer that as we move forward in our Christian walk day by day, that our lives will not reflect the first half, verses one, chapters 1 through 11 of 1 Corinthians, with all their problems. But knowing what it means to be spiritual, that we would diligently search the scriptures, find the grace of God, and put the word of God at work in our lives. And it's amazing what chapter 12 and forward, moving 12, 13, 14 reveals about what's possible to the spiritual person. Let me pray for us. Lord, you give us all that we need for life. You give us grace, you give us mercy, you give us hope, you give us your Holy Spirit. Your son, Jesus Christ, has paid the price and paved the way for anyone who is called by you to draw near to you, to receive you, and to find you, and to find life. You have given us your Holy Spirit who dwells in us, encourages us, compels us, convicts us, and turns us and corrects us according to your word. Let your truth be found in our hearts, in our lives, and let your truth be found in us as we live according to your word as we move according to your word.
And as your truth abides in us, let your people proclaim you for the glorious testimonies of your honor and your praise. May you be blessed this day, O Lord. And may your people rejoice in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.